God of the seasons and sky, you have always been holding my life. And Lord, you are the shepherd of my soul. So I lay down my plans, I give up my rights. Let you take control of the surrendered life So I put my trust in the one Who created the stars and the sun Control of the surrendered life. You comfort, you sustain. In shaking, you remain unmoved and unafraid. Forever and always, you lead. I still waters lead me through the valleys lead me in your wisdom shepherd of my soul you comfort you sustain in shaking you remain unmoved and unafraid forever and always you lead me I still waters lead me through the valleys lead me in your wisdom shepherd of my soul
This is not our last breath. We will open our mouths wide, wide. Oh, 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 My name is Bessel van der Kolk. I'm a psychiatrist, neuroscientist, and author of the book, The Body Keeps the Score. The most important thing to know is that there's a difference between trauma and stress. As I like to say to people, life sucks a good amount of the time. We all have jobs and situations that are really unpleasant. But the moment that the situation is over, it's over. The problem with trauma is that when it's over, your body continues to relive it. Trauma is actually extremely common. There's a lot of debate of what a trauma is to this day. But basically, trauma is something that happens to you that makes you so upset that it overwhelms you. There is nothing you can do to stave off the inevitable. You basically collapse in a state of confusion, maybe rage, because you are unable to function in the face of this particular threat. But the trauma is not the event that happens, the trauma is how you respond to it. Good morning, everyone. I'm so happy that you could join us today. Uh, as you could see from that clip from Dr. Uh, Bessel van der Kolk, our next series is going to be looking into the idea of trauma. Um, and all of us have experienced trauma at some point in our lives, whether it be big or small, and then especially over this past couple of years with a pandemic and a lot of social upheaval and just a lot of different things going on in the world. And trauma isn't, like we saw in the video, just the event that happens, but how we then respond to the situation and how it continues to play out in our minds and our bodies and our relationships from then on out. Um, and as a community under God who's given us all kinds of emotions and ways of dealing with trauma, um, we want to, as a community, lean into this and learn how we can work through our trauma well together. So that's what our series Bitter Herbs is all about. And pretty soon, uh, Andrew's going to come up and talk a little bit about the idea of waiting and what that looks like in the midst of a season of trauma and grieving. Um, but before we go into that, I just have a few quick announcements um, just to put on everyone's radar this morning. The first is that our spiritual formation retreat that we call Catalyst is coming up pretty soon. So every year it's over Martin Luther King's uh, junior weekend 
in January. Uh, so we'll be putting out more details about registration and location and all of that soon. We just wanna let you guys know this is a really awesome time to kind of get reconnected and be able to start off your kind of spiritual formation well at the start of the, the year. So again, January uh, over Martin Luther King's Day weekend, um, be on the lookout for more information about that. Our next announcement is the next mobile food bank is gonna be coming up uh, on the 20th with pre-boxing on the 19th. Um, this is a really wonderful opportunity to serve, to get some free food if you want it or need it, um, and just an opportunity to just very tangibly help people in the community and help reduce uh, food waste um, in Southern Arizona generally. So if you are interested in serving with that, you can reach out to me, Megan Stibrich. Um, You can just find me after service or shoot me a message. I would be happy to get you connected with that opportunity. We also um, are working towards trying to do more and more things live, um, but in order to do things live and in person, we need to kind of build up our volunteer base again. It's been a long time since we've done a lot of this stuff live and not over a video, so we need the people in order to do that effectively. So a few of the areas that we are working on building up right now are a tech team, transport, and musicians. So if any of those are sound interesting to you or if an it was an area you served in before that you'd love to jump back into, please let a member of staff know and we will make sure to connect you to the right people um, to figure out training, getting reconnected, and what those expectations for that will look like. Things will look a little bit different, um, but we want to make sure that we are building up these teams so that we can deliver a wonderful in-person experience um, and do well by our volunteers as well. So if you're interested in any of those areas, please reach out to us. And lastly, we're gonna go into the message soon. Um, so I just want to pray before Andrew comes up and speaks this morning. Lord, we just pray over this message and this series and just talking about something as difficult as trauma. Um, it's something that we'd often rather ignore or pretend like it's not there and it's not affecting us. Um, but we know um, both from your word and science, God, that trauma um, becomes stored in our bodies and our minds and in the patterns we live out every day, God. Um, but we know from scripture and just your work in our lives that you have the power to transform that, God, um, to help us learn to not just ignore difficult things and emotions, God, but to seek you through them. Help us learn how to do that today, to engage with that difficult work in a gracious and loving community of people trying to be more and more like your son, Jesus, every day. We love you so much, God, in your son's holy name. Amen. This probably isn't going to come as a surprise to you, but I'm going to let you in on a little secret this morning. I used to hate exercise. I know, it's shocking. Like, how could I not like exercise? I uh, played all kinds of sports growing up. I joined DR's softball team, zero and eight, let's go. Uh, I even helped run DR's student hangout um, every week on Wednesdays. And to be fair, I genuinely enjoy those activities. I'd happily play a sport or play a game or be on a team, but exercise for the sake of exercise killed me on the inside and more than a little bit on the outside too. I've never been into running or biking or weight training. I even tried hopping on the Choose Fitness craze that a bunch of people from DR were doing a couple years ago, um, but that didn't really work out either. I mean, I never made the time, and when I would go, I would pull some muscle or other that I didn't even know existed. I'm here to tell you this morning that I am reformed. I enjoy exercise now. A few months ago, I decided that I needed to do some things for my health. I needed to drink more water, eat more nutritiously, and exercise more. I reached out to an old gym that I used to go to, uh, got a trainer, and he has been so awesome. He's enthusiastic and uplifting and genuinely invested in my fitness journey. We're doing stuff that I never thought uh, my body could do stuff like yoga and something called a Bulgarian split squat, which is exactly as excruciating as it sounds. However, despite all of our progress, there's one thing we haven't been able to improve. 
No matter how much I stretch or roll my muscles, I can't move my shoulder properly. Specifically, I have below average mobility in my right shoulder. I have trouble lifting my arm over my head, and um, if I move it in a certain way, occasionally I'll get some pain. Thinking back, it's been this way since high school. Um, I hurt myself a lot back then, um, had a couple severe head and neck injuries that kind of trickled down into my shoulders. Despite physical therapy, my body still carries the consequences of that physical trauma. And at some point I accepted, accepted it as it is. I resigned myself to a new reality, one where my physical pain is normal and my body adapted. It changed how I move and interact with the world. I'll never be the same as I was. This is true for other painful experiences too. I've lived through grief and loss and bear the consequences of that. Living in the wake of mental, emotional, and spiritual traumas may be harder to spot than not being able to lift my arm completely over my head, um, but they're no less debilitating. They changed who I am, how I interact with life and people. I accepted my current reality, one where death exists. I grieved as people I love lost parents and babies, family members, friends, and pets. I grieved their non-physical losses too, the loss of their relationships and hopes and dreams. I resigned myself to life as it is and adapted to the pain. We will all experience trauma at some point if we haven't already, and I am, I'm sorry for that. But death and loss, they're inevitable. Never has that been more apparent in the US and in the context of our lives than in the past two years. I'd like to say that we're living in a post-pandemic world, that everything is back to normal, but that's not exactly true. The world has changed. We experienced death on a global scale. Experts call it collective trauma, trauma experienced by a group of people, not just an individual. We went through so much. We lost uh, people, family, friends, coworkers, and neighbors. We lost jobs and homes. A lot of us lost the education that we were expecting from our kiddos to those of us still in college. And all of us lost time. Weddings, birthdays, anniversaries, graduations, all postponed or gone completely. All the while, natural disasters, wildfires, droughts, blizzards, tornadoes, hurricanes continued to get worse. We watched social justice rip apart our communities and mourned the breakdown of social systems designed to protect us. And death is not just physical. In the midst of social unrest, some of us lost our sense of safety, something that the marginalized of us never even had. When we lost our jobs and our homes, we lost our sense of security. When we lost our education, we lost our dreams for the future. When we lost family members or friends, we lost our faith because we looked for God in the darkness and could not find him. When I say we'll all experience trauma, that is what I'm referring to. Trauma is our response to extreme distress and disturbing events. It's the consequence of experiencing death, both literal and figurative, and that consequence extends far beyond the initial loss. It affects our whole being physiologically, psychologically, emotionally, and spiritually. We will never be the same. Many of us will be carrying the consequences of trauma for the rest of our lives. We are living in a new reality, one where death and loss exist. The question then is how we survive in such a world. In the wake of trauma, how do we keep going? Do we resign ourselves to life as it is, adapt to the pain and survive the best that we can? Or is there another way, a way to heal from our loss and move forward? These are the questions that we will be exploring this morning and over the next several weeks as we begin our new series. We'll dive into scripture and examine biblical trauma. These are the stories of God's people, real people, who experience death and loss of their own. We'll learn from them how to move forward like they did 
and how to find hope in the wake of trauma. Trauma is a central theme in the Bible. Death and loss are encoded into the heart of Christianity. They're a part of the foundation of what we believe. God's word doesn't shy away from depicting difficult experiences. At Passover, we eat bitter herbs to remember the suffering of the world. For Jewish believers, it's a time to remember the specific societal trauma experienced by their ancestors during their exile in Egypt. That period of suffering underscores almost everything we read in the Old Testament. The New Testament is no different. The New Testament authors wrote many of their letters against a backdrop of religious persecution, persecution that often resulted in brutal executions. At one point in a second letter to the church in Corinth, the Apostle Paul wrote about his experience. This is from 2 Corinthians. We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die. We don't know what Paul and Timothy went through in this specific instance, but we can make some guesses based on Paul's other letters and the events described in Acts. It's possible that Paul contracted a severe illness, suffered torture and imprisonment, or faced stoning at the hands of Jewish religious leaders. We do know he faced all of those traumatic situations over the course of his ministry, and none of them were unique to him. Paul's experiences are representative of the suffering faced by the early church as a whole. The context of our trauma is different from that of the prophets or Paul or the early church. We have our own share of death and loss. However, our response is the same. When we experience traumatic events, our natural response is grief. Just like trauma, we will all journey through the stages of grief at some point in our lives. That journey is complex and looks different for everyone. The common stages that you're probably familiar with are denial, anger, bargaining, and depression. We're not going to spend a lot of time talking about the grief cycle in detail. It's more important for now that we have a general sense of the journey, which again is complex. Grief is not linear. We will likely skip around, repeat stages along the way. All the while, we learn to survive in the wake of trauma. Worldly grief emphasizes survival. In his book, God's Healing for Life Losses, Dr. Robert Kellerman describes it as sustaining. Everything is hard after experiencing trauma. It takes everything we have just to live. When we grieve, we learn to sustain ourselves again, how to survive in our new reality. That process is normal and good. We have to learn how to survive. It's the first half of our journey. Grief takes us to where we need to be. However, it is not the end of the journey. It's only the midpoint. After we wind our way through the grief cycle, hopefully we end up at a place of acceptance. Worldly grief ends with acceptance of life as it is. For a lot of people, that is where their journey ends. We resign ourselves to our new reality. Death and loss become a part of our story, and we learn to carry the consequences of those experiences. The best we can do is adapt to our pain. In a small way, this worldly grief is reflected in my shoulder. I grieved the loss of my ability to play competitive sports. I adapted to the pain and learned to survive. And for a long time, that was where my journey ended too. In the Bible, the book of Ruth introduces us to several women who are also learning to sustain themselves. Their story is one of biblical trauma. It picks up in the wake of tremendous loss, both communal and personal. We read, In the days when the judges ruled in Israel, a severe famine came upon the land. So a man from Bethlehem in Judah left his home and went to live in the country of Moab, taking his wife and two sons with him. Then Elimelech died, and Naomi was left with her two sons. The two sons married Moabite women. One married a woman named Orpah, and the other a woman named Ruth. But about ten years later, both Malon and Kilian died. This left Naomi alone without her two sons or her husband. 
Naomi and Ruth's story began in the midst of grief. Their family was forced to flee from a famine that left them not only without food, but without a home. They lost their community as the people of Israel left in search for security in other lands. After that, Naomi's suffering only compounded. After settling in Moab, somewhere that was meant to be safe, her husband and both her sons died, leaving their family unable to support themselves. Naomi grieved. She lamented, don't call me Naomi, she responded. Instead, call me Mara, for the Almighty has made life very bitter for me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me home empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has caused me to suffer and the Almighty has sent such tragedy upon me? Worldly grief ends with acceptance of life as it is. In the wake of death, Naomi accepted her new reality. She resigned herself to a world where death was the end and she was left empty. Her pain changed her, rewrote her very identity. And after adapting, after sustaining, she would never be the same. Worldly grief emphasizes survival and Naomi learned to survive. It would have been very easy for her journey to end there. But it doesn't. Death and loss are only the beginning of Naomi's journey, a journey which is shared by Ruth. Through grief, we learn to survive with our pain and sustain ourselves after our loss. However, grief is only the first part of our journey, not the end. As Christians, we have a hope beyond survival. Naomi's story, along with the other stories of trauma in the Bible, can be difficult to read. Depending on our own experiences, they can even trigger significant trauma responses in us. Nevertheless, stories of biblical trauma were not included simply to be painful or troubling. All of the suffering, loss, and death point to one thing, one person. Christ is the center, the cornerstone of all we believe. He was God who became a man to die so that we don't have to. The story of Christ's death is just as traumatic as any of the other biblical stories we read. However, it is through him that all of that trauma is redeemed. It is through Christ that there is hope even in our darkest days, even in the shadow of death, because death is not the end. Heavenly resilience emphasizes healing. We do not have to resign ourselves to a life of pain, and death does not have to define us. Although trauma has brought us home empty, we do not have to remain empty. There is life after death. Christ died on a Friday and rose again Sunday morning. His miraculous resurrection offers us hope for our own healing. Dr. Kellerman puts it like this. In sustaining, we're in a casket, the tomb of grief and loss. In healing, God rolls the stone away. We celebrate the resurrection. We trust in our God who raises the dead. While worldly grief ends with acceptance of life as it is, heavenly resilience offers hope as life as it should be. Stories of biblical trauma are often also stories of biblical resilience. They can be a great comfort to us. They show us how to move forward, how to heal, and how to hope. The Apostle Paul, despite everything he went through, held on to hope. He told the Corinthians, We think you ought to know, dear brothers and sisters, about the trouble we went through in the province of Asia. We were crushed and overwhelmed beyond our ability to endure, and we thought we would never live through it. In fact, we expected to die, but as a result, we stopped relying on ourselves and learned to rely only on God who raises the dead. And he did rescue us from mortal danger, and he will rescue us again. We have placed our confidence in him, and he will continue to rescue us. With Christ, Sunday is coming, heaven is coming, death is not the end. We do not have to stay where we are in the wake of trauma. We can have hope in life as it should and will one day be. 
Through his sacrifice, Christ opened the way for us to join him in eternity. There will be a day where there is no more pain or death or sorrow. God will rescue us again and again and again. He will raise us from our pain and our sorrow until we are no longer empty, but we are restored to the fullness of heaven. I know how that sounds. <laughs> it sounds too good to be true, right? Telling someone in the wake of trauma that everything is a part of God's plan is rarely comforting. In fact, it can be one of the most painful things for us to hear. I've felt that pain myself. To quote Dr. Kellerman, heaven and eternity can feel too heavenly minded to be any earthly good. Visions of heaven can feel too disconnected from our current reality and God can feel too far away to see. However, the exact opposite is true. Ryan talked about this a few weeks ago. Eternity isn't some far off time and heaven isn't some far off place. They are happening right now. God is with us, rescuing us now. The gospel isn't about someday, it's about today. Eternity isn't about getting us into heaven, but heaven into us. A world where there is no more pain or sorrow is not only possible, but happening now. It just might not be happening in the way we expect. God's healing is gradual. It's rarely immediate or flashy. That's not to say that miraculous healings aren't possible. We see all of the time in the Bible that they are. But the true miracle is God's constancy. He rescued us once and he will rescue us again and again and again. The God who raises the dead will raise us too. Every minute, every day draws us closer to him and a world with no more pain or death. His healing gives us the strength to move toward that world one step at a time. We do not have to resign ourselves to living where we are. We do not have to accept life as it is. Heavenly resilience offers us hope for life as it should and will one day be. That being said, healing begins where we are. If Christ died on Friday and heaven is coming on Sunday, we're living on Saturday. We live in the wake of death and loss. We don't have to stay here, but we do have to start here. As much as we want our pain to end or to skip to the end of the process, we can only live in our present moment. Heaven is coming, but we have to wait for it. This idea of waiting where we are is counterintuitive. All of our survival instincts tell us to escape, to get back to how things were when we felt safe and secure. Dr. Kellerman calls this the instinct to regroup. Regrouping is the process of returning life to how it was. It's a form of denial and loops us right back into the cycle of grief. We say, this is painful, I want to go back. I've grieved, accepted life as it is, and now I want to go back to how it was. When we regroup, we exhaust ourselves in our search for immediate answers or meaning. We strive and we struggle to survive through our own strength. We work harder, search for ways to cope and adapt to our pain instead of healing from it. We do everything in our power to get back to how we were, but we can't do it. There's no going back. No matter how much I'd like to, I can't go back to before I hurt my shoulder. I can't go back to when I was 15 pumping iron and jacking up Kobe fades before repeated sports related head and neck trauma sent me down the path to chronic pain and mobility problems. I can't go back to when I was 13 and struggled through my first depressive episode. I can't go back to when I was 19 before I dropped out of music school and mourned the loss of my dreams. I can't go back to 21 before I took a string of jobs that put my physical, mental, and emotional health at risk every day. And as someone learning to accept my gender and sexual identity, I can't go back to before my heart was scarred by a Christian community and a Christian culture that was supposed to keep me safe, but instead, at best, ignores that I exist. In the wake of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual trauma, there is no going back. We're living on Saturday. Friday happened. 
Death, loss, and trauma are a part of our reality now. And no matter how much we want to go back, it will never be Thursday or Wednesday or Monday again. But that's okay. There's hope coming. Sunday is coming. Heavenly resilience offers us hope, not in life as it was, not in life as it is, but in life how it should be. When we wait, we are trusting in faith that the God who rescued us once will rescue us again and again and again. We have a choice every minute, every day. Are we going to regroup? Are we going to exhaust ourselves trying to return life to how it was? Or are we going to wait? Are we going to allow ourselves to be where we are and trust in God's deliverance to come? That's the choice we have to make. It's the choice Ruth had to make. In our story, Naomi wasn't the only one to lose everything. Ruth and her sister Orpah also lost their husbands and with them their homes, their social standing, and the security for the future. Naomi decided to return home to Israel where she could be closer to her people. She then offered Ruth and Orpah a choice. Go back to your mother's homes, and may the Lord reward you for your kindness to your husbands and to me. May the Lord bless you with the security of another marriage. Then she kissed them goodbye, and they all broke down and wept. No, they said, we want to go with you to your people. But Naomi replied, why should you go on with me? Can I still give birth to other sons who could grow up to be your husbands? No, my daughters, return to your parents' homes, for I am too old to marry again. And even if it were possible and I were to get married tonight and bear sons, then what? Would you wait for them to grow up and refuse to marry someone else? No, of course not, my daughters. Things are far more bitter for me than for you, because the Lord himself has raised his fist against me. For Ruth and Orpah, there would be no going back. As much as they would have loved to return to life before they lost their husbands, they couldn't do it. Their time with their husbands and Naomi as a family was over. Naomi had no more sons to give. They grieved together and accepted their reality. Nevertheless, Ruth and Orpah had a choice. Would they regroup? Would they return to their own people for security in an attempt to go back to a time before they knew God? Or would they wait, trusting in God's deliverance to come? Ruth chose to wait. But Ruth replied, don't ask me to leave you and turn back. Wherever you go, I will go. Wherever you live, I will live. Your people will be my people and your God will be my God. Wherever you die, I will die, and there I will be buried. May the Lord punish me severely if I allow anything but death to separate us. When Naomi saw that Ruth was determined to go with her, she said nothing more. Ruth waited. Despite her instinct to escape her situation and regroup, Ruth chose to trust in faith. She held on to a hope beyond survival. Heavenly resilience offers us hope of life as it should be. In the wake of her loss, Ruth may not have been able to see God's plan, but she held on to the hope that a life with him would be better. She trusted that the God who rescued Naomi and the people of Israel would rescue her too. And he did. It wasn't immediate, and it likely wasn't what she expected. But God is constant. He showed up for Ruth and rescued her again and again, one step, one choice at a time. When we choose to wait, we put our faith in God's deliverance to come. We recognize that worldly grief, learning to survive, is only the midpoint of our journey, and there is a hope beyond it. We trust in God's healing. It isn't immediate and may not be what we expect, but God is faithful. He is there for us even when he feels out of reach. He rescued us once and will do it again and again. Every step of faith we take draws us closer to hope, to eternity, and to life as it should be. 
Grief is only the midpoint of our journey. There's no going back, only forward. Over the next few weeks, we'll, took, we'll take a look at other steps that carry us towards hope. However, healing begins where we're at. What are the choices we can make this morning to trust in faith? In the wake of our own trauma, how can we choose to wait and to hope? First of all, choose to be where you're at. You can't go back and you can't skip to the end. Allow yourself to go through the process. If you're still grieving, it's okay. Give your space, yourself space to do that. It's good and normal and healthy. It's the first part of everyone's journey. We have to learn to survive. We just don't have to stop there. We didn't talk much about the grieving process. Um, if you would find a closer examination of grief helpful, I recommend reading God's Healing for Life's Losses by Dr. Kellerman. The whole first half of the book is dedicated to grief. And a lot of what we'll be discussing the next few weeks comes from the book as well. Second, choose community. We do not have to survive alone. Ruth chose to stay with Naomi and reached out to God's people, her people. Paul and Timothy had a substantial network of churches supporting them. Find your people. Last week, Ryan emphasized how life-giving and life-saving a grief or trauma or recovery group can be. Choose to engage with the groups of people that give you life. They will give you the strength to take your next step and choose the next right thing. And when a community isn't enough, reach out to a professional. Find a counselor or a therapist or a psychiatrist. They are equipped with the tools to help you move forward. We do not have to live with our pain. Healing is possible. Sometimes, though, it takes the work of an expert to get us there. Lastly, choose to trust. Trust that despite the pain, you are where you need to be. Trust that life with God is better. It sounds simple, but it definitely isn't easy, especially when we've been hurt. How can we trust God with our safety when he feels so distant or feels like the cause of our pain? It's okay if you have a hard time with this. Spiritual trauma takes time to heal just like any other. It isn't immediate. However, God is constant. He will meet you again and again. Start small. Try healing your trust with God the same way you would with another person. Pray regularly and just talk. Give him small pieces of your heart. See what happens. Heavenly resilience offers us hope in life as it should and will one day be. Your relationship with God may feel broken right now, but it doesn't have to stay that way. We may not see him right now. The darkness, the pain, the sorrow may be too much. But trust that the God who raises the dead rescued you once and will do it again and again and again. He's certainly rescuing me in large and small ways every day. After months of gradual progress and therapy, the pain in my shoulder is completely gone. I'm only one or two weeks away from being released from my physical therapist to do normal arm things. For the first time in years without pain, I can reach the top shelf, throw a softball, and hold the bow of my violin. I get to tell 13-year-old Andrew that I found my people, the ones who support me through my depression and anxiety. Every day, the pain in my heart is a little less. I can tell 19-year-old me that there are new dreams and a new job for me at 21. I accepted work with DR and Missions Door, work that is both fulfilling and life-giving. I'm excited to help create a community where people can not only exist as themselves, but feel safe and welcome. I have hope, not in life as it is, but in as it should and will one day be. Healing begins where we are. We live on Saturday, Friday happened. Our reality is one where trauma and loss and death exist. There's no going back, but that's okay. Sunday is coming. We can move forward. We do not have to resign ourselves to life as it is. God's healing gives us the strength to move one step at a time toward life as it should be. 
The God who raises the dead is raising us too. He's done it once and he will do it again every time until heaven comes. There will be a day when there is no more pain or sorrow, and that day is not distant. Let's walk towards it together. Please pray with me. Father God, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that you are near, no matter how dark life seems, how heavy the sorrow, how deep the pain. We thank you that you show up for us every time, that you are rescuing us and raising us to your glory, to glory in heaven, to a world with no more pain or sorrow. I pray that your presence be felt in this room, in our hearts and our lives, so that we have the strength to move towards you one step at a time. Amen. We are going to enter into a time of reflection. This is a time for you to pray about the message, let it sink in, um, and also to fill out your communication card. Um, you can find that form, it's all digital now, which is fun. You can find that form on the Church Center app um, and also in the YouTube. Um, there will be some spaces for you to reflect um, and take some action steps this week. And there's also a spot for you to give us your name and any information that you're comfortable with and any prayer requests that you might have for us. A song is going to play, so I'm going to just invite you to take some time um, and reflect.
I always appreciate that we take communion every week here at Damascus Road, but it seems extra poignant to me during a series like Bitter Herbs. Andrew talked this morning about the importance in choosing community when starting to process our grief and trauma. And I think there's a beauty in knowing that right now we are joining together intentionally as a community to remember all that God has done for us through Jesus' sacrifice on the cross. It doesn't matter how wonderful or crummy your week was, it doesn't matter if we feel like everything is great or everything is falling apart. We are together, right here, right now, to remember that our God knows grief. Our God knows pain. Our God knows the ups and downs, the highs and lows, the victories and the traumas that come with being human because he chose to become one of us. The most basic definition of communion is the sharing or exchanging of intimate thoughts and feelings, especially when the exchange is on a mental or spiritual level. We can choose that this morning with each other. We can choose that this morning with our Savior. Jesus chose communion with his disciples, and we can join together with them. And every other Christian in history, this morning in community, and the symbolism of this bread and this wine. So as we prepare our bread and wine this morning, let's read Paul's words in choosing community with the early church. For I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread and gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Take and eat the bread. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. Take and drink the wine. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you are announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Please pray with me. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you for sending your son, Jesus. I thank you that he knows grief, he knows pain, he knows joy and triumph, and he knows everything about the human experience. And even when he was grieving what was going to be happening to him, his death in the garden, that that he still chose um, what was best for us and what your plan was. I pray that these elements of bread and wine may remind us of Jesus' sacrifice as we go through this week and that his love is with us no matter what is going on in our lives and we can always lean on that. We pray this all in your name. Amen. Part of our weekly rhythm here at Damascus Road is to leave a space and a reminder for tithes and offerings. And this is just a way each week for us to be reminded to give back a portion of our income, the things that we earn, and give that back to God to help support God's work in the world, support our church, and the work that w and ministry that we are trying to do to serve both our internal and external community in the world at large. And if you're not sure about Damascus Road, um, please feel no obligation to give. Um, but if this is your community, I want to encourage you um, to give and to help support in that way. 
Um, we use Church Center now for our giving. And one thing I want to make you aware of with Church Center, um, with these trips and retreats that we have coming up, so like the Edomocio service trip that's coming up with Catalyst that I mentioned earlier, if you are interested in directing your gift in terms of scholarship to help someone to go to Edomocio, to help someone go to Catalyst, um, you can direct your giving towards that, towards a scholarship fund on there. And so that'll be in Church Center if that's something you're interested in. Just wanted to um, give that reminder about offering this morning. And next, um, I just want to invite you to come back next week. Uh, we're going to be doing a few weeks on this um, series. We're not done kind of talking through this process of grief and trauma just yet. Um, and next week, Tyler will be talking about this idea of wailing, of lament, and how we make our grief external, how we learn to work through that and um, make that something active and tangible that we can engage with in helping us to process trauma. So I encourage you to come back, continue to work through this material um, together in our community over these next few weeks. Um, and finally, we're gonna go into a time of worship. Uh, so I should encourage you, um, get up, enjoy this time praising God and being able to process your week or your day or whatever is going on inside through song and praise and this time to just be with God and to be in God's presence this morning. So join us for worship today. <laughs> 